Okay, our first speaker is Isabel Garcia Garcia, who is going to tell us about Bounce of Nothing. Take it away, Isabel. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak. Um, my talk is going to be largely based on these two papers uh, that I've written recently with my collaborators, Patrick Draper and Ben Lillard, who are at UAUC. So before I get into that, uh, let me start with some of the motivation behind the topic of this talk. So one of the most fundamental aspects of any theory is the question of vacuum stability. The standard tool to study vacuum decay in quantum field theory has been the semi-classical formalism developed by Coleman and collaborators. And especially relevant for this talk will be the work of Coleman and the Lucha that includes the effect of gravity in the discussion of quantum tunneling. However, in theories that feature extra dimensions that are compactified, there can be additional instabilities that naively cannot be well described within the Coleman de Lucha formalism. And the most famous example of this is the so-called bubble of nothing. So this was discovered by Witten in 1982. And as I will discuss more in a couple of minutes, uh, this is a type of instability that quote unquote uh, destroys the space time. So why should we pay attention uh, to these bubbles of nothing? First of all, as you all know here, um, I don't need to explain uh, to this audience, extra dimensions are a common ingredient in many well-motivated extensions of the standard model, including a string theory. So this immediately raises the question of whether our own universe could decay eventually into, into one of these bubbles. The metastability of the sitter space, so the question of whether uh, the sitter exists within a full gravitational UV completion, as you know, uh, is not a completely settled question, but what is largely uncontroversial is that if the sitter exists, it will likely only be uh, metastable. So in a theory with extra dimension, uh, is it possible for four dimensional the sitter vacua to decay into a bubble of nothing? More generally, if bubbles of nothing are indeed a generic instability of theories with four-dimensional uh, Minkowski or the Sitter vacua, then this decay channel could play a very important role in the physics of vacuum selection, as for instance, uh, could be relevant in the context of the string landscape. In this talk, I am going to focus on identifying what are some of the necessary conditions for bubbles of nothing to be possible in realistic models, specifically I'll be focusing on extra dimensions that are stabilized. Uh, so I will assume, assume that there is a stabilizing potential for the modulus and that that potential is stabilized at a positive value of the, of the vacuum energy. So in particular, I will discuss uh, how to include a potential for the radion when analyzing this type of instabilities and what the conditions are on that potential for bubbles of nothing to exist. I will explain how the relevant instanton in these cases can be described as an intermediate object between Witten's bubble and the more familiar bounds of Coleman and the Lucia. And finally, I will discuss the effect of a stabilizing potential on the decay rate of these instabilities. And I will pay special attention to what happens in the limit where the four dimensional CC uh, vanishes. So people have found a bubble of nothing solutions in the context of flux compactifications in, in 6D. Uh, so in this sense, uh, these previous papers provide an example proof, if you want, that bubbles of nothing can be compatible uh, with a stabilized modulus. Our work in this uh, two recent papers is uh, complementary to this approach. So we are not interested in so much in finding bubble of nothing solutions in a specific constructions, but rather in trying to assess how generic these solutions can be, and especially on studying the effect of, of a potential on the, on the decay rate of the bubble of nothing. So let me start with a brief review uh, of vacuum decay in quantum field theory and also uh, Witten's bubble. So as you all know, the semi-classical treatment of quantum tunneling is centered on finding the so-called bound solution. So this is the non-trivial solution to the Euclidean equations of motion uh, that asymptotes to the false vacuum and that has a single negative eigenvalue. So in the absence of gravity, it is possible to show that the bounds is O4 symmetric. So it only depends on the O4 symmetric combination of the Euclidean coordinates. Our job is therefore to solve the equations of motion uh, together with the boundary conditions, which are that again, the solution asymptotes to the false vacuum and if we want a non-singular bounds, that the first derivative at the center of the bounds uh, is zero. 
So the Euclidean action of the bounds tells us about the decay rate or the false vacuum. In particular, it directly gives us the, the corresponding tunneling exponent. Moreover, the analytic continuation back into a Lorentzian spacetime gives us both the initial conditions for the nucleation of true vacuum bubbles and also their subsequent evolution after, after nucleation. Including gravity, and this was done in this uh, paper by Coleman and De Lucha, requires now treating the metric as a dynamical degree of freedom. Luckily, uh, the offer symmetry of the bounds uh, restricts our attention to four dimensional metrics that can be written in this rather simple form. So the only additional degree of freedom that we need to deal with is this scalar quantity rho that corresponds to the curvature radius of uh, the unit three sphere. And itself, it is only a function, again, of the offer symmetric Euclidean radial coordinate. So for a real scalar field that is minimally coupled to gravity, both the scalar and Einstein equations take this uh, rather simple form. So for example, uh, the solution to these equations that corresponds to the, the Sitter false vacuum is given by phi equals uh, its value in the false vacuum and rho, again, the curvature radius of the three sphere is just a sign uh, in these coordinates. And this little l uh, refers to the size of the, of the cosmological the Sitter horizon. So the changes that come from introducing gravity are on the one hand quantitative. So for example, for the Sitter to Minkowski decay in the thin wall limit, uh, the tunneling exponent now receives corrections that are suppressed by, by some power of the Planck scale. But the changes uh, can also be qualitative. So for example, if the decay is from instead from Minkowski to anti the Sitter, there is a special value of the difference in energy densities between the two vacua for which the tunneling exponent uh, becomes infinite. So gravity is capable of stabilizing certain vacua that would be unstable in the, in the absence of gravity. So already the simplest example of a real scalar field that is minimally coupled to Einstein's gravity illustrates how gravity is an essential ingredient in any treatment of quantum tunneling that the effects are not only quantitative, but that there can be uh, very important qualitative surprises. And this is even more so in theories that contain extra dimensions. Um, and the most shocking example of this is probably the, the bubble of nothing instability that was discovered by, by Witten. So Witten's bubble is an instability of the purely gravitational calusa klein vacuum uh, in four crosses one. And I am going to refer to the radius of, of this uh, circle as, as capital R. So this vacuum has an unperturbative instability and the relevant instanton is the five dimensional Euclidean Schwarzschild solution, which is given by, by this metric. So notice that the Schwarzschild radius here is the same as the asymptotic value of the radius of the fifth dimension. Uh, this is necessary for the solution to be smooth. And as you know, uh, for Euclidean black holes, the Schwarzschild coordinate uh, little r only spans the range from, from capital R out to infinity. So unlike their Lorentzian counterparts, uh, Euclidean black holes have neither an interior region uh, nor a singularity. So if uh, in the near horizon region, uh, it is convenient to define a new radial coordinate uh, and a new angular coordinate in this way, and this allows us to write the, the five dimensional Schwarzschild metric in this form. So we have an R2 factor as well as a three sphere with, with, um, with curvature radius uh, capital R. So the five dimensional uh, Euclidean Schwarzschild geometry is completely smooth. So asymptotically for, for large values of the radial coordinate, it looks very much like the false vacuum. So the cylinder um, that I was showing you in the previous slide. And then in this near horizon region, uh, it has this characteristic cigar-like shape. Okay, so I've told you uh, about the instanton that describes the decay of the calusa klein vacuum, but I haven't told you uh, what that vacuum decays into. So as usual, the way to find that out is by analytically continuing our Euclidean solution back into Lorentzian signature. And in the coordinates we're working on, uh, this is done by rotating one of the angular variables uh, into the complex plane. So this gives us the space time to which the KK vacuum decays. So what is this space time? 
So again, asymptotically, um, and after a coordinate redefinition, it is trivial to see that this space-time is precisely the same, uh, looks exactly the same as our original KK vacuum. However, unlike the original vacuum, this new space-time only exists for values of the radial coordinate that are larger than the, than the Euclidean Schwarzschild radius. So, this new space-time looks very much like our original uh, false vacuum space-time, except that a hole or a bubble has appeared inside of which uh, the space-time no longer exists. Therefore, the name of uh, bubble of nothing for this, for this instability. So initially, uh, the radius of this bubble is the same as the radius of the extra dimension in, in the false vacuum, and later, uh, it expands with a speed that asymptotes uh, the speed of light. So that, in that sense, uh, that is similar to the expansion of bubbles of true vacuum in the, in the familiar Coleman de Lucia process. The tunneling exponent for the decay rate into a bubble of nothing is just the Euclidean action of the 5D Schwarzschild solution, uh, which is given by this expression. And indeed, this is much bigger than one, provided that the size of the extra dimension is much bigger than, than the Planck length therefore justifying uh, a semi-classical treatment. <clears throat> so the purely uh, gravitational calusa klein vacuum is indeed a solution to the five dimensional Einstein's equations uh, for any value of the radius of the, of the fifth dimension. Uh, in other words, uh, the size of this circle is not yet stabilized. And it is in this context that Witten's instability um, leads to the decay of these, of these false vacuum. However, in reality, uh, we know that any compact dimension must be stabilized. So in the rest of this talk, I am going to discuss what is the effect of a stabilizing potential on this class of instabilities, both in terms of their existence and also on the effect uh, it has on, the, on their decay rate. So first of all, it is actually useful to um, realize that Witten's bubble can be written as the solution to a somewhat unusual for dimensional uh, Coleman de Lucha problem. And this was first pointed out a few years ago by Dine and collaborators. So as most of you know, uh, if we dimensionally reduce GR in, in five dimensions, we can write it in terms of a real scalar field, uh, minimally coupled to, to gravity. Uh, so the relevant four dimensional degrees of freedom for us will be the four dimensional metric, uh, as well as the radian field that sets the size of the extra dimension. And it was noted in this paper that Witten's bubble can be written as a solution to the four dimensional Coleman de Lucha equations with a vanishing potential for the scalar field. The O4 symmetric uh, Coleman de Lucha coordinate is related to the radial Schwarzschild coordinate uh, formally through this expression. Uh, notice in particular that the center of the bounds at chi equals zero corresponds to R equals capital R. Uh, which is precisely the tip of, of the bubble of nothing uh, cigar geometry. Of course, this is not quite a solution to a traditional Coleman de Lucha problem, but rather uh, one where the bound solution uh, looks singular. So these two pictures uh, show the bound solution uh, for both the scalar field and the metric degree of freedom that correspond to the bubble of nothing. And here in the bottom, uh, I am writing down their analytic expressions in the region of a small chi, so near the center of the bounds. So this bounds is singular at chi equals zero, both the four dimensional rich scalar as well as the first derivative of the scalar field uh, diverge as we approach the center of the bounds. Crucially, uh, the combination that enters into the Euclidean action of this bounds is such that all divergent pieces uh, cancel and the final answer is finite. And indeed, um, the four dimensional calculation of the tunneling exponent obviously reproduces the result that, that I showed you earlier. However, the value of uh, writing Witten's bubble as the solution to a Coleman de Lucha problem is that we can now easily turn on a potential for the scalar field and see how that changes uh, these solutions as well as the, the action of the corresponding instanton. So the qualitative form of the radium potential that I'm going to have in mind for the rest of this talk is of this form. Uh, so I am going to focus on a potential that has a local minimum at a value of the vacuum energy density that is non-negative. Um, I'll take it to be positive and then we'll take the limit of vanishing CC at the end. 
so the potential around this local minimum has the usual quadratic form and little m here uh, refers to the mass of the radion in the in the false vacuum the behavior of the potential in the compactification regime so as phi goes to infinity uh, is not going to be important in this talk but it is well known that in theories with extra dimensions, uh, the vacuum energy density uh, must vanish in the compactification limit. So this is only meant as a cartoon, uh, but the reason I am showing you this is that one of the implications of this behavior is that a local four dimensional density vacuum will generally be unstable to decay into a theory that has vanishing energy density and extra dimensions that are no longer compactified. So this instability um, typically goes by the name of spontaneous decompactification. And although it is not the topic of this talk, it will give us something to compare the, the bubble of nothing instability to, okay? In particular, the tunneling exponent uh, for very tiny values of the, of the vacuum energy density is given by this expression. So notice in particular that it diverges and therefore the, the decay rate goes to zero as, as this vacuum uh, becomes Minkowski. What is going to be important uh, for the rest of this talk is the behavior of the potential in the compactification regime. So in the limit that phi uh, goes to minus infinity and the size of the, of the extra dimensional circle, uh, the KK circle shrinks to zero. This is what matters in order to determine whether bubbles of nothing survive or not in the presence of a, of a stabilizing potential. So unlike what happens in the decompactification regime, uh, the behavior of the potential in the compactification direction uh, is in principle, uh, it's not some universal property of theories with extra dimensions. In principle, it will depend on the details of the, of the underlying UV theory. Okay, so the very first question uh, we will want to answer is what well, class of potentials are compatible with the existence of a bubble of nothing? And I am going to parameterize the behavior of the scalar potential in the compactification limit uh, in this way. So V0 is just a constant that sets the overall scale of the potential. And then this uh, coefficient gamma appearing in the exponent um, in principle, it may be positive or negative. I am not making any prior assumptions uh, regarding the, the sign of gamma. So if gamma is positive, then as phi goes to minus infinity, then the potential uh, will die off, uh, will go to zero. But if gamma is negative, then this expression diverges in the, in the compactification regime. So if I now look at the coleman de Lucci equations with a potential for the scalar field, and let me focus first uh, on the equation for phi, then this right-hand side for a potential of this form evaluated on uh, the bubble of nothing is given by this expression, okay? On the other hand, uh, both terms on the left-hand side that diverge as uh, one over xg square near the center of the bound. So if this right-hand side either vanishes or at least diverges more slowly than the terms in the left hand side, we will know that at least uh, solutions with boundary conditions at the center of the bounds, like those of the bubble of nothing, are possible in the presence of, of such a potential. And this turns out to be true, uh, provided our exponential coefficient gamma is larger than minus root six. So bubbles of nothing uh, boundary conditions in the presence of a potential are always possible if gamma is positive. Um, this should probably not be too surprising. So remember when gamma is positive, the potential goes to zero in the compactification direction. Uh, so we might have guessed that bubbles of nothing would survive in that case. But it is also possible for certain values of gamma that are negative, okay, up to minus root six. And these negative values of gamma, as I said, uh, correspond to potentials that go to infinity in the compactification limit. In fact, uh, the boundary conditions at the center of the bounds are a little bit more general than those of Witten's bubble. And to see this, um, notice that there is not just one, but instead a one parameter family of bubble of nothing solutions uh, to the column and the Lucha equations in the absence of a potential for the scalar field, okay? And I am calling the relevant parameter here um, eta. And in principle, eta um, can be any positive real number. So for Witten's bubble, uh, we've been taking um, eta equals to one. In fact, uh, when the potential for the scalar field is really strictly zero, it is easy to show that the only effect of these, uh, introducing this additional parameter, uh, the only effect of eta is to rescale 
the full five dimensional metric uh, by a constant conformal factor. So the only thing we're doing is changing the five dimensional Planck scale by um, an overall constant. So in fact, in the absence of any potential for the scalar field, we can still eta to be one um, without loss of, of the generality. When there is a potential, however, uh, the, the bubble of nothing solution will only be an approximate solution to the equations of motion uh, in some finite region near the center of the bounds. And in this case, uh, the meaning of eta becomes, uh, becomes physical. And actually, the best way to see this, um, the best way to see what it means is to look at the five dimensional metric near the center of the bounds. And we see that eta appears as a rescaling of the radius of the, of the three sphere in the near horizon geometry. So eta is parameterizing a mismatch between the radius of the bubble of nothing, which is given uh, again by the radius of the, um, of the near horizon three sphere, where I'm calling R3 here and the asymptotic radius of the KK circle in the, in the false vacuum. So for Witten's bubble, again, these two quantities are equal to each other, um, but in the presence of a potential for the radian, uh, the radius of the bubble of nothing needs to be self-consistently determined uh, when solving the equations of motion. So in the last five minutes, um, I am going to discuss how to obtain an approximate analytic solution for this class of bounces. And to do that, I will need to make some uh, simplifying assumptions. Okay, so first of all, we are going to be interested in the behavior of the decay rate in the limit of uh, vanishing vacuum energy. So as the false vacuum becomes Minkowski. So I am always going to take the, the city radius to be the largest length scale in the problem, okay? And I will often ignore terms that vanish in the limit that the, the city radius goes to infinity. I am also going to take the mass of the radion to be parametrically below the KK scale. Uh, and we're going to use the dimensionless product M times R as an expansion parameter to build the bound solution. And finally, um, I will take the overall scale of the radian potential to be a smaller than, than this combination of scale. So in particular, much smaller than M Planck square over uh, times the KK scale square. And this will just allow us to, to ignore uh, the detailed features of the potential, what the potential looks like to the left of the, of the false vacuum. So I want to emphasize that uh, none of these um, assumptions are necessary for the existence of these solutions. In fact, they are not even important for the qualitative features that I am going to discuss, okay? But they are going to make our life a little easier. I mean, as you saw, uh, when we try to find analytic solutions, uh, we can typically only do so under some assumptions uh, in some regions of parameter space. And we do relax uh, these assumptions in, in the numerical analysis that we show, that we present in our two papers. So under these assumptions, uh, the bound solution remains very similar to the bubble of nothing well into the regime of large rho, meaning rho larger than the KK scale, uh, than the KK radius. Um, in this regime, rho grows linearly with Xi and the solution for the scalar field uh, as a function of rho is given by, by this expression. Uh, so assuming that eta again is not one, but a number close to one, and this assumption I will justify uh, a posteriori in the next slide, then the solution remains very much like the bubble of nothing um, until phi is, is very close to its value in the, in the false vacuum. Once in this regime, we can actually solve the equations of motion uh, with the form of the potential that is appropriate uh, around the false vacuum. And we can find the solution uh, in terms of, of Bessel functions, okay? Uh, C here is just um, a constant of uh, integration. So for values of rho uh, much smaller than one over M, the solution looks very much still like the bubble of nothing, uh, like you would expect. But for rho much bigger uh, than one over M, this function um, falls exponentially. So in this regime, the scalar field is approaching its value in the false vacuum exponentially fast. So phi approaches its value in the false vacuum and provided the vacuum energy density is positive, then rho also transitions into the expression that is appropriate to the, to the Sitter false vacuum. Demanding that the solution remains continuous as it transitions from the bubble of nothing behavior to the near false vacuum behavior allows us to abstain uh, an analytic expression for this uh, parameter eta. Um, 
which as I said earlier, parameterizes the radius of the bubble of nothing. So that expression looks like this. And notice that under the assumption that n times r is indeed a small number, then eta is indeed a number uh, close to one. So here is what one of the solutions looks like. And the solution uh, has been obtained numerically. So again, in the solution near the center of the bounds at x equals zero, which is uh, zoomed out here in this, in this gray square region, uh, the solution looks very much like the traditional bubble of nothing. And then um, for uh, asymptotically, it just approaches um, the, the behavior of, of the false vacuum. Okay, you see it turns into, into a sign function at the end. So the way to obtain these solutions numerically, and I promise I'm almost done, uh, I know I'm running a bit late, uh, is qualitatively, uh, is very similar to, to the shooting method that can be implemented for the traditional Coleman de Lucha bounds, okay, except that the singular um, behavior of the bounds at the center means that the appropriate initial condition for the suiting problem is not to start with zero velocity, but with infinite velocity, okay? So for Witten's bubble, for instance, um, when there is no potential for the scalar field, the, the term proportional to phi prime, uh, the friction term is doing all the job uh, of balance, balancing the phi double prime term. Um, so as the solution to a shooting problem, we can find a Witten's bubble by shooting from minus infinity with infinite velocity and then stop at some arbitrary point uh, that again, with a loss of generality, we can take to be phi equals zero. If we have a potential for the radion that dies off in the compactification limit, uh, it is not hard to see that the shooting problem should also have a solution where we shoot in from infinity from the compactification limit and then stop in the false vacuum. What we've also shown both analytically and numerically is that that initial condition of infinite velocity can be enough to overcome even a potential that is growing exponentially, okay, provided this rate uh, is, not, is not too steep. So, okay, let me just in the last two minutes uh, discuss the effect of the potential on the tunneling exponent. So there are basically two types of contributions to the action of these instantons. Uh, one can be written as a sort of uh, boundary term evaluated at the center of the bound, so actually equals zero. And a second piece takes care of the effect of the potential for the scalar field, okay, including the subtraction of the, of the action of the De Sitter false vacuum. So because I'm running a little bit late, let me skip the comments on the detailed features of these two terms. Let me just give you uh, the final answer. I'm happy to answer questions about uh, this later. So in total, and under the assumptions that I introduced earlier, we can find um, an analytic expression for the action of these instantons. And it is a small correction on top of the bubble of nothing action, okay? and. In doing this calculation, actually, I emphasize I've neglected all contributions that vanish in the limit of, of vanishing vacuum energy. There are corrections to this expression that if I relax the assumptions I made earlier could become important. So for example, there are also contributions to the action that go like V naught R to the fourth, uh, V naught again, the overall factor that sets the scale of the potential. Um, so if you remember one of the assumptions I made earlier was that V naught was much smaller than M Planck square over R square. So under that assumption, uh, that is indeed a small correction to the bubble of nothing action. But if this is not satisfied, if I relax this assumption, then this correction uh, will not be a small perturbation, okay, around the original Witten result. What will not change, however, and this is crucial, is that all these corrections are finite corrections to the action of Witten's bubble. And this remains true even in the limit of, of vanishing vacuum energy. And this is in a stark contrast with the other instability that is generally present when there is a, uh, a four-dimensional the sitter vacuum, which is the case of spontaneous decompactification. If you remember from my earlier slide, the tunneling exponent in this case is given by this expression, so it diverges in the limit of vanishing vacuum energy. So for sufficiently small values of the vacuum energy, uh, the case through a bubble of nothing like instantons, um, when it exists, uh, could always be faster than some of the other traditional Coleman de Lucha channels, okay, like spontaneous decompactification. So let me finish with some conclusions. Uh, I've argued that bubble of nothing instabilities can survive in the presence of a stabilizing potential for the radion. And this can be true even if the potential grows in the compactification limit. Although as I've discussed, 
there are some limitations on how fast uh, the potential can grow for these solutions to still exist. More importantly, uh, in the example I've discussed, uh, the case of a Zeter false vacuum, the decay rate into a bubble of nothing remains finite in the limit of vanishing vacuum energy, uh, which means that for a small enough CC, it will become the dominant decay channel at some point. So one of the most obvious implications of these results is in the context of vacuum selection. So for instance, if I compare the bubble of nothing decay rate to the current um, Hubble volume, then the demanding stability against the bubble of nothing could give us an upper bound on, on the size of extra dimensions that is parametrically uh, somewhat above, above the Planck scale. And this is truly the very last slide I have. Uh, so I have not talked about this uh, here, but supersymmetry plays a very interesting role in suppressing the decay rate into a bubble of nothing. So supersymmetry can provide either a topological obstruction or a dynamical obstruction for the nucleation of, of one of these bubbles. And it was speculated uh, by Dine and collaborators that perhaps this could tell us something about the physics of supersymmetry breaking in our world. Uh, what about the inverse process? Uh, if it is possible for the universe to decay into a bubble of nothing, then nucleating a universe from nothing uh, might also be allowed. So could this mechanism create a universe uh, that looks like ours? Uh, this is obviously a very interesting question that has been studied to some extent. A closely related question is what is the meaning of nothing in the context of a true full ubic complete theory of quantum gravity? Um, is it really as bad as it sounds or is it just a different phase of gravity perhaps for which we are just not using the appropriate degrees of freedom? So what I've discussed in this talk uh, and what we discussed in our two papers has been in the context of a five dimensional toy model. Um, there is much left to understand obviously about the physics of bubbles of nothing, uh, both in general and in particular in the context of realistic constructions. But I hope I convinced you that these instabilities could potentially play a very important role in our understanding of how the standard model fits into a UV completion and that the implications uh, can be profound. So thank you. And I'm so sorry about running over time. No, no worries. Thank you very much, Isabel, for the excellent talk. Uh, let us thank Isabel with our clap emojis. Okay. Um, our first question is from Irene. Yeah. Hey, hello. Thank you, Isabel, for the talk. Thanks. Yeah, I just have a quick question. In the conclusions you wrote that um, it could happen that the decay rate for the bubble of nothing is larger than the usual Coleman de Lucia, but then you wrote Provided that supersymmetry is not restored in the exactly. limit. Indeed, this is provided yeah. supersymmetry is not restored in the limit where the vacuum energy goes to zero, which, as you know, could be restored. Uh, and in that case, but you know, why is that important? Why, why is that important? I could potentially, I, I'm not sure it would be important or not. Um, I could imagine. Um, as you know, I mean, when supersymmetry is part of the picture and supersymmetry is restored, the picture is a little bit more complicated. There can be dynamical obstructions to the nucleations of bubbles of nothing. Uh, I'm not saying it's important. I'm not saying I know it's important, but we haven't thought about that enough for me to say this, okay. this picture will not change if supersymmetry is also restored. Uh, that's... Okay, but if it's just a dynamical obstruction, then I mean, once you check how it also modifies the Coleman and maybe it's still the bubble of nothing is maybe it's still so i think that's obviously a very interesting question i mean the motivation here was also that you know in our universe supersymmetry is broken by more than is required by the vacuum energy so that was sort of the motivation to think about the limit of a small cc while still neglecting the possibility of restoring supersymmetry but i think i, I mean i think that is a great question and i don't have i don't know for sure what the answer is yeah Okay. Yeah, it would be nice to study this in any condition. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question is from Miguel. Yeah, uh, super nice uh, talk, Isabel. Uh, thanks a lot. So I have a question about the, the, the boundary conditions that you have for the bubble of nothing. Yeah. So you have, basically, the scanner goes to infinity at the wall of the bubble. To minus very... infinity. Yeah, in, in the conditions uh, yeah. where, yeah. Yeah, it goes to infinite distance, right? And it goes to infinite distance logarithmically. So I just wanted you to... Yeah. You know, do you, do you have any insight to as to what are the most general boundary conditions that you should have for a you know, general That is a great question. Th that is a great question. So these boundary conditions, um, I mean, as you've noticed, I was uh, using sort of the same boundary conditions as for Witten's bubble, you know, the, the four-dimensional reduction of 5D Witten's bubble, okay? 
as I said here, they are a little bit more general because you know there is this extra parameter data. Um, but yeah, it's still logarithmic, and this definitely does not encapsulate, uh, for example, solutions where a higher dimensional manifold is ranked to zero size. Oh, so, so those ones don't go logarithmically? Well, for the case where you have a two sphere, uh, you can still have that being true, but more generally, um, when you have an n sphere, actually that's not true. When you have an n sphere, you can still find, but there are bubble of nothing solutions where the field behaves like this. And in fact, this dimensional reduction is still sort of encapsulates those cases. Mm -hmm. But I completely, I mean, by no means we have, we argue, we have shown that this is like the most general uh, possibility. There, there could be other reductions that show more general behaviors. I see. It, it might also be like, you know, to take the point of view, this is like the kind of behavior they get, you know, like in cosmic strings and the distance conjecture. So it could be that it's really the universal thing, right? The logarithmic? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's possible. Uh, I mean, and I didn't discuss it here, but in the long paper, we do um, sort of extend. I mean, we are still assuming a log, uh, but we are sort of, I mean, actually, just very quickly, I don't want to, I'm making you very late. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but, you know, we are sort of like uh, allowing this exponent, for example, to be general, and we nevertheless find that typically this collapses to one third, just if you demand the smoothness of the solution and things like that. So we've generalized a little bit away from just Witten's bubble, uh, but I mean, by no means I can claim like general to encapsulate any potential solution of this type. So that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, 